Why does Pope Francis dislike the traditional Latin Mass? You might even say, why doesn't Fra why does Francis hate the traditional Latin Mass? Today we're going to look at the news story that broke over at LifeSite News. Exclusive Pope Francis defends restrictions on Latin Mass. He says, read the motu proprio. A correspondent at LifeSite News doing good work. Ask the pontiff straight up. What about Traditionos Custodis? And he said, read the motu proprio. It's all in there. And today I'm going to discuss with you why it is that Francis Bergoglio, in his formation as a Jesuit, but even deeper, in his formation as an altar boy, he acquired a disdain for the traditional Latin Mass. I've talked about it before, and in a book called, let's see if I can pull up the, the image here, it's called... Dear Pope Francis, it's a book for children. And in this book, Francis talks about his experience as an altar boy and a problem that he experienced in the traditional Latin Mass. And we're going to explore that today. So stay tuned. Make sure you like the video, subscribe, etc. And you may have been wondering, where has Taylor Marshall been? It has been a fortnight. I think it's been 15 or more days since I have published a video live a new video and that's because i've been very sick you might be able to still hear it in my chest i got some horrible respiratory disease i had covid two years ago and it wasn't anything like this covid was like four days and i was back on my feet normal this day five day six day seven i was going deeper and deeper and deeper worse and worse so i appreciate all of your prayers it took me about almost two weeks i was in bed for about six days i was really sick. <clears throat> so I may be coughing a little bit or adjusting my voice, and I appreciate your patience and your prayers. And of course, we're talking about serious things today. We're talking about Francis. We're talking about the traditional at Mass. And so in order to orient ourselves to that which is true, good, and beautiful, we're going to open up and we're going to pray the Our Father together. We'll pray it in Latin. Oremos nomini patris et fidei et spiritus sancti. Amen. Pater noster, qui es in celis, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum de nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos a malo. Amen. Saint Peter, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Nomini Patris et Fidei Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Well, it's good to be back, back behind the mic. I actually did sit down in this chair and get everything ready to go at least two times before, but my voice and my cough were just too much. I couldn't do it, but I think I'm going to make it today without interruption. We'll see how it goes. Okay, so this is the news that came out uh, through LifeSite. It's a big story. What happened? Speaking of LifeSite News, and I'm reading this article by Michael Haynes over at LifeSite News. Here it is. Speaking to a correspondent, Francis defended his 2021 restrictions of the traditional liturgy, the traditional Latin Mass, stating that all the reasons for enacting such restrictions are found in the motu proprio traditionis custodis. Quote, Read the motu proprio, everything is there for you, he told a LifeSite Vatican correspondent. And when asked why, given that so many young people love the traditional Mass, why is it that so many people, young and old, love it? Why had he restricted it? He says, read the motu proprio, everything is there for you. And a lot of people don't understand, especially if they're not Catholic, but then there's a lot of people who attend the Novus Ordo Mass, and they don't understand why Francis wants to crack down, why he wants to restrict it. And I've been asked this by a lot of Protestants, like, what's what's different about the traditional Latin Mass that Francis doesn't like it? Because you'll read articles. Here's an article from the, what is it, the New Yorker. Many secular news outlets, yeah, here's one here, 
This is from the New Yorker. What's behind the fight between Pope Francis and the Latin mass movement? So this is a 2023 article in the New Yorker. So this this reveals to you that this is um this is a mainstream discussion. And I wanted to talk about it today. I mean, we talk about this all the time on the Taylor Marshall podcast. Please subscribe so you don't miss future content. Why is that? Well, I think there's a really good hint in this book, Dear Pope Francis, right here. And I'm going to read to you one of the sections in this letter, uh, book of letters by Francis. And, and here it is, okay? Dear Pope Francis, were you ever near the priest as the altar boy? Greetings from Alessio, Italy, age nine. Okay, there it is. Dear Alessio, yes, I was an altar boy. This is Francis writing, right? This is Francis Jorge Bergoglio writing here. Yes, I was an altar boy. And you? Question mark. What part among the altar boys do you have? It's easier to do now, you know. You might know that when I was a kid, mass was celebrated different than today. So he's referring to serving in the traditional Latin mass. Back then, the priest faced the altar, which was next to the wall and not the people. Then the book which he said that, with which he said the mass, the missal, was placed on the right side of the altar. But before reading of the gospel, it always had to be moved to the left side. That was my job, to carry it from the right to the left. It was exhausting, exclamation mark. The book was heavy. I picked it up with all my energy, but I wasn't so strong. I picked it up once and fell down. So the priest had to help me. Some job I did. The mass wasn't in Italian then. The priest spoke, but I didn't understand anything, and neither did my friends. So for fun, we'd do imitations of the priest, messing up the words a bit to make up weird sayings in Spanish. We had fun, and we really enjoyed serving mass, end quote. Now, I think there is a lot. If you are a Freud or a Jung, there's a lot you could dig through in this little passage. I'm not a psychoanalyst. I'm not a psychologist. I think most of that stuff is bunk anyway. But there's a lot going in on that quote. All right. So young Jorge Bergoglio served the traditional Latin mass. And if you've been to the traditional Latin mass, there are, there's the altar. The priest faces the altar. He faces the crucifix. His back is to the people. And if you're looking at the altar and the priest is back at you, back at you, on the right side of the altar, that's called the epistle side or the epistle corner of the altar. And the left side, if you're looking at the altar, is called the gospel side or the gospel corner. And that's because the priest reads the epistle on, if you're facing it, your right and he reads the gospel on your left. And the idea here is there is a movement at the altar that mass begins, if you're facing east, it begins in the south, the mass moves to the north, and then it returns to the south. And actually the proper way to light candles is to begin, if you're one person, on the south side, and then the north side, and then if you extinguish candles, north side to south side. All right, so this is, what does this mean? Well, if you check out my book, Antichrist and Apocalypse, I talk about this meaning of South and North and East as it is in the Jewish understanding of cosmology. And it's not just the Jewish understanding, it's the Christian, it's the Catholic understanding. And it's enshrined in the traditional mass. It's also enshrined in the Eastern liturgies as well. It's only when we get to the Novus Ordo in the 1960s that we lose this cosmic orientation to our liturgy. It's really sad. If you want to learn more about that, get the book Antichrist and Apocalypse. If you want signed copies, go to patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. And a special thank you to everyone who does support this podcast and supports my work. If you'd like to support what I'm doing, the kind of books I'm writing, the kind of 
shows I'm making and podcasts, please support. Go to patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. And thank you to all the generous patron Patreon patrons over there. So that's what he's talking about. All right. He's talking about his role in moving the missile from the epistle corner to the gospel. And then after people have received communion, the altar boy removes it from the gospel side and puts it back on the epistle side. But he says it was heavy. And it can be heavy. The book is heavy. And the missile stand is often made out of bronze or brass, and it's gilded, and it can have stones on it. So it can be heavy, especially for a young boy. If you're 8, 9, 10, 11, that could be really heavy. And it seems that at one point, Francis Bergoglio accidentally dropped the missile. And the priest had to help him. And he even says, kind of sarcastically, some job I did. Now, as a father of eight kids, I have a little bit of insight into this and I want to share it. I'm going to be a little vulnerable with you today. I'll tell you a story from our own family, our own family history. I have four sons. My youngest son was serving mass. And on this particular occasion, he was serving benediction of the blessed sacrament. I believe it was a Saturday. And I, my wife and I and our family, we were in the front row of church that day. And we had three of our sons serving at the altar. So as a father, my heart is just beating out of my chest with, with admiration and pride for my three sons. They've been practicing. They're saying the Latin responses and they're orchestrating in the sanctuary with the priest. I could not be happier as a father. And one of my sons, Blaze, you've seen him here on the podcast with me before. At the time, he was probably nine, I'm guessing. And he, at Benediction of the Blessed Sacrament, was carrying a big brass candlestick with a candle on it. And at a certain point in Benediction, I can't remember what it was, he was going, there's steps. In a traditional church, there's there's the sac, uh, there's sanctuary, and then there's usually at least three steps going up to the altar. So he was at the base there, and he was going around the perimeter of that area at the foot of the altar. And as he was carrying this with it kind of blocking his sight, he went to make a right angle around the bottom of the steps, and he tripped on the very corner on the epistle side, probably the same size side that Jorge Borgoglio fell on. And he fell down full horizontal, and that big brass candlestick smashed onto the ground, made a huge noise, candle went out, and he was embarrassed. In that moment, I could see in his face how embarrassed he was. And as a parent, your heart goes out to your child because you realize they're so embarrassed in that moment. He got up, picked up the candle, I think he finished out whatever he was supposed to do in that liturgy, but his candle was not lit. And after mass, I could tell that he was flustered, or not mass, after benediction. And I said, hey, you know, don't worry about it. It was an accident. You were up there as an honor guard for Jesus Christ. You were bringing honor to Jesus Christ, and you, you tripped. You know, you're wearing a, a cassock, and you got this candlestick in front of your face, and you couldn't see, and you're new at this, and you're young. And probably that candlestick was pretty heavy for him. You know, don't worry about it. But he was really, you know, embarrassed. And Joy and I, you know, hugged him and said, don't worry about it. But since that day, he has not served Mass. He just won't do it. He remembers that. And I think it's not that so much that he's embarrassed about himself. He's a very devout and good boy. And we have assured him over and over. And, I'll, and I'm always encouraging him, you know, let's get back on the altar. You know, you can do this. But he has that memory. And I think for him, there is this sense of this was very sacred. This was the adoration, the worship of the Holy Eucharist. And I made a mistake. Why am I getting phone calls on here? Um, I made a mistake. And I disappointed, let me do something here. My phone's going off the chain here. I made a mistake. 
and it was a mistake in the presence of God. So I fully understand that, and my heart goes out to Jorge Bergoglio as well. If he was moving the missile and he dropped it, and the priest had to help him pick it up and move it, all that, that right there for a young man is embarrassing because out in the nave is your mom, your dad, Aunt Rita, your neighbor, all the other altar boys. They saw that, right? And it's not just making a mistake on a mistake on an auditorium stage. You're making a mistake on the altar, the sanctuary. So it's it's a big deal, and I get it. So I don't want to make light at all about Francis or Jorge, little Jorge Bergoglio, dropping the missile. And if I were his father, I would have done the same thing. Hey, Jorge, don't worry about it. Those those missiles are heavy, you know, and couldn't see where you're going and, you know, don't worry about it. You know, no one holds it against you. You didn't do anything wrong. It was a mistake. You know, we learned from our mistakes. But from what I understand about the biography of Jorge Bergoglio is that, what is the deal with these notifications? Everybody just, everybody just said, let's call Marshall and I'm hitting that DND, do not disturb. And this is what happens when you go live. I'll just turn the phone off. The thing about Jorge Bergoglio is that I don't think he has a strong father figure. He has a very strong attachment to his mother, but not so much to his dad. And I kind of wonder, this is me wondering, this is not me making any dogma here, but, you know, for my own son, who has a father who loves him and, you know, I'm very committed to Catholicism and the liturgy and the traditional Latin mass and very reassuring and trying to, you know, help my son not feel bad about dropping the candlestick during benediction of the blessed sacrament. If you're a young man and you don't have that father to sort of give you a hug and slap you on the back and say, don't worry about it, you know, what does that do? And then what does a mother say? in the absence of a father to her son in that situation. Now, the other thing that I think is really interesting here is not only is Francis talking about sort of disdainfully how the priest faces a wall, it's in the quote here, and how it was uh, sort of this choreography of liturgy that was more complicated than Novus Ordo, there's also the references here to the Latin, all right? He says, you know, it wasn't in vernacular, it wasn't in Italian or Spanish, it was in Latin, and we didn't understand anything. We didn't, under, what does he say here? The priest spoke, but I didn't understand anything, and neither did my friends. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and call BS on that, all right? And here's why I'm going to call BS on that. I got eight kids. We go to the traditional Latin Mass. My wife, Joy, has been going to the traditional Latin Mass for 14 years. Joy has never taken a Latin course in her entire life. She pretty much understands what's going on in the traditional Latin Mass. My kids, now, many of my kids haven't taken Latin classes, but not all of my kids. They, although they're not fluent or they can't decline or conjugate Latin words, they know what's going on in the traditional Latin mass. They couldn't spot read the Roman canon, but the basics of the mass, Dominus Vobiscum et cum spiritu tuo, um, Gloria in excelsis, Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Ecce Agnus Dei, Ecce Quitolis Peccata Mundi, all these things, my children know those things. And it's not because they have a Catholic nerd dad who's always breaking down Latin with them. It's because they have lived in that liturgy. And my kids are English speakers. Jorge Bergoglio is a Spanish speaker. And Spanish is super close to Latin. So there's no way that you could go to Mass every Sunday of your life as a Spanish speaker for 10 years in the Latin Mass and not understand a single word that's going on. It's just not the case. And I'll go into the comments and questions here in a little bit. I want to hear from the Spanish speakers especially 
because my experience with trads who are Spanish speakers is they're pretty advanced in their understanding of what's going on in Latin, even if they've never taken a Latin course. And I've had these conversations with them. So I'm not, I, I just don't, I just don't see how that's the case that he didn't understand any of it. But here's the part that's really troubling. He says, for fun, we would do imitations of the priests, messing up the words a bit to make up weird sayings in Spanish. We had fun and we really enjoyed serving the mass. That's not good. If my son was doing that, like instead of saying Dominus Vobiscum et cum spiritu tu, and he was saying stuff like et tu scusi 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 or something like that, and was messing up, and making little funny things, you know, dropping a missile, dropping a candlestick. Hey, man, don't worry about it. We make mistakes. But messing up the words of mass? That's not good. That needs some very swift parenting involved there. And I think his eventual vocation and his formation in the Jesuits, that there is a disdain for formality, choreography, and I'm going to call it masculine order in the Roman Rite. The Roman Rite has a simple masculine order that is distinctively Roman, as in the Roman military. There is an ethos, there is a pattern to the Latin mass in the Roman rite. And effeminate men and same-sex attracted men tend not to like that structured, orderly, logo-centered, Liturgy. Now, there is a crop of sort of fancy boys. I think they call them the, the Queens of Trent that love not so much the liturgy and sanctity, but, you know, silk and brocade and all kinds of fancy, fancy stuff around the liturgy. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Roman nobility and simplicity of the mass. Mama's boys don't like that. They're into improv. They're into Broadway. They're into that, you know, that kind of music that's in like Cats. Man, Cats, I've never seen it, but I've seen previews and outtakes. I would rather be punched in the face and the midsection to see something like cats on Broadway. It looks horrible. But this whole like Elton John subculture loves that kind of stuff. And they don't like the logos ordered masculine Roman ethos of the liturgy. I think this is what's going on in the Jesuits. I think this is what's going on when we have all of these effeminate, soft theologians, seminaries, bishops, priests. They look back at these sort of antiquarian things of having to move the missile from the epistle side to the gospel side and back to the epistle side and having Latin and the priest with his back to the people facing a wall. He's not facing a wall. He's facing God. They, they, they kind of look at all this with derision. And Francis sees that there are people who hold a strict orthodox view of Catholicism. They believe it doesn't change. They believe that the dogma never changes, the morality never changes, that what was true for Catholicism in 33 AD and in 325 and in 431 and in 1500 and 1700, 1800, 1900, and 2024, it's all the same religion with no changes. That is what Francis calls rigid. Rigid. 
The opposite of rigid is limp-wristed, soft. The answer to dropping the missile during mass or dropping the candlesticks during mass isn't, well, let's just get rid of the missile or let's get rid of moving the book or let's get rid of the candles or let's get rid of benediction or let's get rid of boys having to make right angles in mass. The answer is continuing to train, continuing to be better, to become soldiers. That's how you get vocations to the priesthood. When we changed that and we made it soft, everything hard, all the right angles are gone and we softened it all out to smooth services. What happened? Vocations tanking. You can't attract the adventurous male spirit with cats and Andrew Lloyd Webber and Elton John and Apple Teenies. That is the problem. And Francis Bergoglio, from the beginning of his ministry in Argentina, represents that soft, beige Catholicism. It hates the rigidity, the logos, the order. It likes the softness. It likes the round corners, not the right corners. And for 50 years, the seminaries have promoted the kind of theology and the kind of personality that promotes that softness. That's the reason why liberals, modernists, don't like the traditional Latin Mass. And the traditional Latin Mass, I was talking to a bishop once. This was early on when I had come into the Catholic Church. I'll say who it was. It was Bishop Kevin Van, who was Bishop of Fort Worth, Texas. He's now Bishop of Orange. We were talking, and I had, my wife and I in the, in the family, had, we'd been going to the traditional Latin Mass. And I told Bishop Van that, and he was alarmed. I could tell he was a little bit agitated by that. Well, why is that? Taylor. Well, it's just very reverent and, you know, our children actually pay attention more. You know, there's something very important going on there and, you know, there's good sermons and good formation. We like it. And Bishop Van said, well, there are people that use the Latin mass as a banner of rebellion. Now, at the time I was much younger and much more naive, and I was kind of taken back by that. Like I never heard of anybody using the Latin Mass as a banner of rebellion. But that's exactly how these bishops and how Francis have been formed. They see the traditional Latin Mass as a banner of rebellion. To them, it's almost like a swastika. It's an icon, it's an image, it's a logo, it's a meme of old time Catholicism. And to be honest, old time Catholicism did not have room for fiducia supplicans, Amoris Laetitia, Laudato Si. Old time Catholicism was not concerned about climate change and making people feel more, people seeking to have orgasms in certain ways that are contrary to the Catholic Church and making them feel comfortable. That's not old time Catholicism. You want to have orgasms in a certain way, that's against Catholic teaching. So we're going to create all this pastoral complex to make you somehow feel comfortable. That's a problem. So yes, for them, and honestly, as the years have rolled on, I've realized that the traditional Latin Mass is in a way a banner. I wouldn't call it a rebellion because it's obedience to Jesus Christ, to the Father and the unity of the Holy Ghost. But 
the traditional Latin mass is the location. It is the, the ground zero of the distinction between how do we approach God, how do we speak about God, and how do we relate to God. And that has to do with everything from the priest facing east to the altar rails to, to receiving to receive communion, I'm sorry, to kneeling to receive communion, to receiving communion on the tongue, not in the hand, to the style of music, Gregorian chant, to the architecture as straight with domes that are geometrically in proportion to the buildings, cruciform architecture, vestments that are cut for the dignity of the priest and to elevate our understanding of the sacrifice on the altar. All of these things define who we are, who God is, and how we relate to God. So yeah, the Latin Mass becomes a banner. It becomes a standard, a flag. This is how we understand Catholicism. And then someone else says, well, no, no, this is how we understand Catholicism. Round, holding hands, receiving communion in the hand, facing one another. The Mass is not offered to the Father. The Mass is offered to the community. You know, you'll see priests, and they'll offer, you know, they'll say, instead of saying, this is my body, and then elevating it to the Father, they'll do stuff like, take, eat, this is my body. What's he doing? He's offering it not to the Father, he's offering it to the people. That's a different understanding of how we approach God, or if we are even approaching God in that moment. And this is why Jorge Bergoglio, as a young man, as a Jesuit seminarian, as a cardinal, and as Francis, understands Catholicism and understands the traditional Latin Mass. And he understands that that is a friction. Pope Benedict, as a German, as a Hegelian, could, could live with a thesis and antithesis. He could live with both, ordinary form, extraordinary form. Francis will not live with that. He realizes that it is a different Catholicism. And the really inconvenient fact for Francis or even moderate middle-of-the-road guys like Bishop Barron is that by choosing the new, they have this embarrassing reality that the old was always there, and I think they know deep down it will always be here. They want it to sort of be in the shadows or to be placed in a ghetto, or they want to discount it by saying, well, those people are really grumpy and mean. Don't go there. We are the new springtime. We are the new Pentecost. We are the new evangelization. Rah, rah, rah. But that system and that liturgy and that theology, it's not just cracking, it's imploding. And more and more people, especially since 2020, when we had the lockdowns, more and more people are gravitating to that old form of Catholicism and it drives Bergoglio crazy. I'm gonna to go to your comments and your questions. I know there's a lot talking. Glad to be back here today. I am going to, while I go into your comments and questions here, I am going to pause and clear my throat so you don't have to hear that. And then I'll come back in. So I'm going to mute. And I'm back. All right, going into your comments here. See what you guys are talking about. Yes, new church. New Mass. Okay, here is what I wanted to hear. This is from DR. All right, so earlier in today's episode, I was talking about how 
France is saying he didn't understand a word of the Latin Mass can't be true because my children, my young children, understand a lot of what's going on in Mass. They never learn Latin and they're English speakers. And the Spanish speakers like Jorge Bergoglio, the Spanish vocab and the Latin vocab are like a very strong Venn diagram. So I know trads who are Spanish speakers and they have a remarkable understanding of Latin as is. So for for Francis Bergoglio to say he didn't understand it, that just doesn't make sense. So here's DR. He says, I'm a Spanish speaker and I understand a lot of the Latin in the mass. So thank you, DR. I'd love to hear from more Spanish speakers. Is that also your experience? Because um, that is, that's my experience. Uh, Joey's in the moderator. Thank you, Joey. He says, put the question marks in so I can see that they're questions. I appreciate that. All right. Mary M says, I worry his successor, Francis, will be no better. You know, two days ago was the feast day of St. Fabian. And Pope Fabian was a layman. He was from the countryside of Italy, and he came into Rome. I don't know the reason why he came into Rome. This is a funny story. He comes into Rome, and the Pope has died in Rome. This is in the 200s, mid-200s. This is a funny story. They're trying to elect the next Pope in Rome. Fabian goes to the church or whatever where all this is going on. Oh, what's going on? You're elected the Pope. And a white dove <laughs> descends onto Fabian's head and sits there on Fabian's head. He's a layman. He's not a subdeacon, deacon, priest, bishop. And everybody looks, oh, look at that white dove. On Fabian's head, Fabian's like, there's a dove on my head? And everybody recognizes that the white dove is a sign of the Holy Spirit. And with acclamation, they all agree. The lay people, the priests, the suburban bishops around the city of Rome who are there gathered for the vote, they all agree. God wants Fabian to be Pope, and they make Fabian the Pope. And, po and he goes on to be a great Pope a sainted pope, and he even is a martyr under the emperor Decian. He's a martyr. So that was two days ago, I think, Pope St. Fabian's feast day. By the way, if you need a good Catholic calendar to keep track of all these feast days, fast days, you got to get my 2024 traditional Catholic calendar. It has the 1945 feast days and fast days and the 1962 feast and fast days. It's the only traditional calendar that I know of that has both of these options. It's the traditional Catholic calendar that I have wanted for about five years. So we made it. Here it is. Get your copy at store.taylormarshall.com. Store.taylormarshall.com. Get your trad calendar. If you have your calendar, you know it's Pope Fab Fabian's day. I kind of hope that we have a situation where somebody like Bishop Athanasius Schneider's in Rome and a dove land, white dove lands on his head and everybody says, you know what? Forget all these cardinals. Let's forget all these cardinals. There's a white dove in that guy's head. We're voting on the white dove guy. Hey, it's happened before. It could happen again. Call me crazy. Mary Pierce, she's on Facebook. We got people watching on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter right now. By the way, uh, there's almost 1,500 people watching, and there's only 400 likes. So you guys got to get in on those likes. We need at least half of y'all liking the video. So get those likes up. Mash the like button. Let's go. Mary Pierce says, feels like Pope is worshiping Earth with his climate worship. He seems to be pagan or is like other politicians, using it to redistribute global wealth, communist it looks. Well, yeah, last week, Francis had a meeting of Christians and communists working together. That doesn't make sense. Communism is opposed to Catholicism. Three popes have said so. It seems like he's worshiping earth, he did sanction and promote the worship of Pachamama. Pachamama is a South American Mother Earth goddess. He issued a Vatican coin with Pachamama on it 
The pregnant belly of Pachamama is the globe. That was an official Vatican coin issued by Pope Francis. This is not a conspiracy. This is history. This is facts. This is what Francis is promoting. He promotes Pachamama, which is Mother Earth Goddess. Facts. Facts. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at him. Yeah, but Taylor, it's like an indigenous symbol of like being one with creation and just being kind to one another and having community. No, it's a it's an idol of Mother Earth. It's a Mother Earth idol. If I brought a idol of Demeter, the Greek goddess of Mother Earth, into my home and told my wife and kids to worship it, I would be a horrible father promoting idolatry in my house and scandalizing my family. Period. That's it. Gabriel says, what about Nostra Aetate from 1965, way before Pachamama? I don't get the Francis bashing. Uh, Nostra Aetate is about other religions, but uh, I don't think Nostra Aetate said worship Mother Earth. Not the version I've read. Patty says, all you need is Father Lassant's Latin English Missal. I agree. I got one right there. I won't get up and get it because it's right there. But that's why I also got, not to beat a dead horse here, but that's why I got this candle, because the Father of Sons uses 1945. SSPX and FSSP usually use 1962, so you kind of have a little slippage. That's why I designed this calendar. has 1945, Father of Sons, and 1962. All together, go to store.taylormarshall.com, get your copy. Thank you, Patty. James says, why do... Why do we venerate saints with their actual bones? This is because in the Old Testament, the bones of Elias resurrected a man. It's in the Bible. We also read in the book of Acts that the body and articles from Peter and Paul healed illnesses. And it's the testimony of the early church. They would always collect the remains. Relics means remains, by the way. They would always collect the remains of the relics of the martyrs, and they would place them in the altars of sacrifice. So when they're celebrating the Eucharist, the Eucharistic sacrifice, they have the relics of the saints in the altar. Hey, Taylor, where did that come from? Well, it's actually in the Apocalypse. The book of Revelation, chapter 5, says the martyrs in heaven are under the altar, which is in heaven. There's a heavenly altar, and the saints and martyrs are in heaven underneath that altar. So it actually comes from the Bible. Everything Catholic is biblical. By the way, if you want to get more of that, go to New St. Thomas Institute, nsti.com. I need to fix this here. This is kind of crazy. What is going on here? This is crazy. Go to nsti.com. I got a whole course on the Old Testament and the New Testament It'll help you understand those things. Also, there is the Catholic Bible cheat sheet at NSTI. It'll give you all those verses on relics because you need them because Protestants are going to ask you about them. All right. Here we go. John says, new altar boy at our SSPX chapel, probably 10, little guy, struggles for moving the Bible over to the gospel side. Every time I'm praying, he doesn't drop it, but he won't take help. Think of, I think he's probably think of, or yeah, I mean, it's a struggle, okay? And these little guys, you know, I'm not faulting Jorge Bergoglio for, you know, not being strong enough. Maybe he was smaller. He didn't choose that. God chose that, right? And when embarrassing, hard things happen in our life, and it's happened to every single one of us, we can internalize it as a wound that, that continues to bleed or with the right direction, hopefully it builds our character and we become a stronger person. I also think it's worth noting as a father that we got to be careful to make sure that we don't set up our children, and in, the case, in this case, altar boys, for this to happen. So if you have a small altar boy, 
maybe he shouldn't carry the heavy missile. Or in my case, maybe it would have been more prudent if he wasn't carrying the big brass candlestick, but was doing something more simple. I think that's also part of prudence and wisdom. All right. Everybody's saying thank you. Hope you're feeling better. I appreciate that. Appreciate it. By the way, if you have any show ideas, you know, I'm getting back into my seat here and writing more podcasts, writing more content. So if there's a topic or something you'd like for me to cover here on the Dr. Taylor Marshall podcast, please drop it into the live chat or into the comments below, and I will consult those. And if there's some good ideas, I'm sure there will be, I'll begin curating those topics. And while you're at it, make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell. So if you do recommend a topic and I do do that show, you don't miss it. All right. Jane says, I never saw cats on Broadway, but I have seen it locally twice. I love kitties and I love cats. Okay, no offense, Jane. It's not my deal. I get people that are into it. Hopefully I didn't offend anybody by uh, knocking Andrew Lloyd. Is Andrew Lloyd Webber? Yeah. I think he's the one that made cats. <clears throat> Lots of good topics coming in here. Love it. Daniel says, more long-form mini-docs. Totally agree. Yes. Uh, Taylor, stream the Latin Mass you attend. Yeah, don't know about that. I don't know if anybody at the traditional Latin Mass wants Taylor Marshall with his iPhone filming the traditional Latin Mass. I don't think that's a good idea. Taylor Marshall live streaming traditional Latin Mass. I like this right here. Me and my Orthodox friends love Latin Mass. And here's the thing. We're all about, well, all these people since the 1960s were like, ecumenism, let's all come together. We, the Eastern brothers breathe with two lungs, ecumenical gathering. Well, guess what y'all have done? By approving the blessing of same-sex couples, fiducia supplicans, and by restricting and persecuting the traditional liturgy, the Orthodox are offended. They are offended. I've heard that the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, the Orthodox think it's great when there's a traditional Latin Mass there, because I've been there and had a traditional Latin Mass, and they think it's totally hokey for there to be Novus Ordos at the Holy Sepulchre, because they can see the difference. The ancient Roman rite, the traditional Latin Mass, conforms to the Eastern liturgies. The Novus Ordo doesn't. It's more loosey-goosey, and the Eastern Orthodox don't understand that. And that's why you see this comment right here. My Orthodox friends love the Latin Mass. You have to realize, if you want the Eastern churches to come back into union with Rome, the Rome can't be scandalizing them with same-sex blessings and hokey liturgies. The East ain't going to go for that. Little did you know that by promoting the traditional Latin Mass, you're promoting true unity. This is awesome here. Joel, I'm 59. I just recently learned to serve the traditional Latin Mass. I love that. I, have also, I also serve the traditional Latin Mass. Uh, I served the traditional Latin Mass recently for Bishop Strickland. And a lot of people are surprised. They're like, well, you're an adult man. You serve the Latin Mass. Yes, you can be an adult man and serve the traditional Latin Mass. St. Thomas More, the, mar the martyr, the Chancellor of England under Henry VIII, he served the traditional Latin Mass as an adult male. Before Altar boys are actually more of a recent phenomenon, in, I mean, within the last like several hundred years, five, six hundred years. The most traditional is to have more older adolescent or adult men assisting in the liturgy. So yeah, if you're an adult man, you should, every adult man should know how to serve the traditional Latin Mass. Boom. <sighs> uh, Stephen says, where can you buy the calendar again? I'll put it up again. Right here. Store.taylormarshall.com. So you go to my website, taylormarshall.com, but you put the store dot in front of it. Store.taylormarshall.com. 
It's also linked below in the show notes of this on YouTube. Thanks for asking. You're never too old to learn. That's correct. You're never too old to learn. Here we go. Jane from on Facebook. Explain why we shouldn't receive our Lord by the hand and what Our Lady said about it. Okay. You should only receive communion on the tongue. Yeah, but Taylor, the early church. Okay, listen. St. Basil the Great said there are reasons for receiving communion in the hand. I'm going to give them to you right now. This is documented. Number one, in a time of persecution. Okay, Taylor Marshall is Catholic. He's in prison. He's sentenced to death on Thursday. A deacon finds out about it and sneaks to the prison and through the prison window says, Psst, Taylor, are you in there? Yeah. We're praying for you, brother. I've been authorized to bring you the Eucharist before you go and meet your Lord in martyrdom. Can you get it? Yes, yes. And I climb up to the window and he, he hands me the Eucharist through the window and I receive Holy Communion with my hand. That's one acceptable way to receive communion by hand, according to St. Basil the Great, in persecution. The other reason for receiving, <coughs> pardon me, the other reason for receiving communion in the hand is lack of clergy in a monastic setting. What does that mean? This is interesting. St. Basil explains, as you know, there were the desert fathers. These were monks. These were men, ascetics, who were out in the desert of Egypt. And they prayed all day long. And they didn't go into the cities. They didn't go to the liturgy on Sunday. They were just out in the wilderness praying. Hermits. But... Clergy would go and visit them occasionally, especially, for example, during Lent. And they would re leave with them pyxes, P-Y-X. And in the pyx, they would put particles of the Holy Eucharist. And in this way, on a Sunday or a feast day, for example, if Easter were coming up, the hermit in his isolated area could open the pyx and on Easter receive Holy Communion. You see, this is what St. Basil the Great teaches. The whole understanding here is when you're not in these extreme situations, you receive communion directly into your mouth. This is the early church. Well, yeah, but Taylor, there were some people receiving in the hand. Yes, in persecution, in extreme situations. But if you're at church on Sunday and there is no persecution and there's two priests at the front of the church distributing Holy Communion, you receive in your mouth. There is no necessity to do this and then do this and then do this and then do this. Well, Taylor, I don't do this. Well, what do you do? If you receive communion in your hands, there's a video on YouTube. A guy takes black gloves and he takes hosts that are not consecrated from the Catholic goods store and he puts hosts on the glove and takes them off. And you can see particles are left on the gloves. That means every single person receiving communion, maybe not every, let's just say half, half the people receiving communion have particles on their hands that fall on the ground, go into their pockets. You know, what's the solution? Receive communion and then lick your palms? Well, why not just receive communion in the mouth and avoid all of these problems? And yes, our blood, <coughs> pardon See, that cough's coming back. Our Lady received communion in the mouth, and she wants us to receive communion in the mouth. All right. I want to thank everybody who's a patron, supporting at patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. Appreciate all of y'all. Um, what else do I want to say? I feel my cough coming on, so I got I to gotta sign out. I can feel it kind of getting weak. So thanks for all your prayers. I appreciate all of you. Make sure you like this video. Oh, I see. Look, almost half of you have liked the video. That's great. Thanks for liking the video. Thanks for subscribing. I appreciate all of y'all. 
happy epiphany a time. That's another thing. In the traditional ways, we're not in ordinary time. We're in epiphany tide. So happy epiphany tide to everyone. And we'll soon be moving into Septuagesima, which is also called pre-Lent. Beautiful season, beautiful tradition. God bless all y'all. We love you. Joy and I love y'all. Thanks for all your prayers. Feeling much better. Y'all are the best, smartest, best audience in the all of YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Rumble world. So thanks so much. And let's close. <coughs> Here comes my voice. Let's close with a Hail Mary. Oremos. Nomini Patri, Sit Fidi, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in molieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, <coughs> Mater Dei, <coughs> or per nobis peccatoribus, nunc et ator mortis nostre. Amen. Nomini Patri, Sit Fidi, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right. My... My lungs are done. Tapping out, tapping out. Remember, our Lord Jesus Christ is you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless, Godspeed, and go find a traditional Latin mass.